So we, we are dedicating this class to the absolute complete healing of Rafael Moshe Ben Hana, longtime attendee of the class. And we all wish that Moshe should have a complete, 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 complete healing on yeah. every single level. Absolutely, on every single level. All right, let's say our blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Banu Banu Amim Benasan Lanu S Taraso Baruch Atah Adonai Nosein Atora Shema, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. All right. So today, Monday, was the birthday, or is still the birthday of Rebetzin Chaim Mushka, the wife of the Lav Rebbe, completing 121 years. So we uh, know that a birthday is a very special time. And I do believe that this year we actually, uh, our class was in proximity of her passing. The date of her passing also was, I don't remember, maybe it was on a Monday. So we, um, so we spoke then about her. Um, of course, I don't have notes from then, so I don't know what I said, but I think I sort of remember. So I'm obviously trying to focus on different aspects now. And um many, 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 many different things to say. So of course it's not a problem. You just have to remember what you said. So there were three dimensions of the Robinson that I wanted to focus on tonight. And of course, in each one of them, I wanted to look at it in terms of how does this relate to us? When someone passes away, we're supposed to always look at the person that passed away, think of their virtues, think of their attributes, and then think, so how does this relate to my life? What do I do about this? And as I change and grow and I'm inspired by the person that passed away, that person lives on through me. And that's the verse, hachai tenalibo, the living take to heart, that when someone's living and they think about the person that passed and they think about their special qualities and they resolve to grow and work on themselves and emulate in some way this person, this allows the person to continue living through them. So therefore it's a very appropriate thing to do and now we're looking at it in terms of the Robinson, whose birthday is today. And of course, we know how special a birthday is, as we've discussed many times in this class. So I want to focus a little bit on some of the things we see in terms of the Rebbe and Robinson and marriage. Because definitely we could always, always uh, be inspired in that direction. And if you're not currently married, it's relationships in general. I think what we marriage is just this ultimate relationship. I said, all mirrors relationship with God, and it mirrors other human relationships as well. So after the Rebetzin passed away, a big rabbi, obviously many big rabbis, came to the Lubavitcher Rebbe to give comfort, as we say, to be Menachem Ovel, to visit the mourner and comfort. And this rabbi asked the Rebbe, what was the Rebetzin to the Rebbe? How would you describe your wife from your perspective? And the Rebbe said, the Rebbe said, the Rebetzin was my inner dimension. The Rebbe used the Hebrew term, my pnimi, which means my inner dimension. What, what made me move? You know, if you think of the, what makes a train go, is it the wheel? That's very important. Is it the conductor? That's very important. Is it the gasoline? You need that too. But what makes the train go is the motor. That's the inner dimension. And the Rebbe was saying here that like, she was my motor. And that's really in general, I thought like a really, um, a deep insight in a wife and a husband relationship that the woman is the pnimi, that inner dimension, that dimension that inspires the husband to do what he needs to do, that nurtures the husband and gets him to move. Um, I thought that was an interesting perspective on marriage and on woman, woman as the force, woman as the power, woman as the motor. And here you're talking about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So, you know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was saying, my motor, what got me to move, what pushed me forward, 
was my reference and was my wife. And we know something that I'm sure I've shared before, it's a very famous thought in terms of the Rebbe and Rebbe in a marriage, is that the Rebbe and the Rebbe always make time every day to talk to each other. And every day they would have tea and they would talk. And the Rebbe said, actually to someone I know, so I heard this firsthand from the person who heard it from the Rebbe, that his time together with his wife, his tea with his wife, was as important to him as his putting on tefillin every day. Now, I can sometimes exaggerate a bit when I talk for dramatic effect, but Blavavich Rebbe didn't exaggerate. So when he's saying that my daily tea is as important as my daily tefillin, he really meant it. He really meant it's that important to me to spend that time with my wife. And I thought that was something we can all remember and put in perspective. Someone once asked the Rebbe, this wasn't connected to the Rebbe sin, but someone asked the Rebbe, there's, it says that it's an auspicious thing for a marriage, for peace in the home, Saturday night after the Sabbath is over, after the Shabbos is over, to fold your talus, the fringe prayer shawl. So people say, this is it true, is it not? Who knows? So someone was once by the Rebbe in a private audience, and he asked the Lavcha Rebbe, is this true? He's heard it said that if you fold, you know, you don't just like dump it, but you actually fold your prayer shawl Saturday night, this helps peace in the home. And the Rebbe responded and said, I don't know. But if you fold your sleeves and wash the dishes, that will definitely help peace in the home. And I thought that was also a nice perspective. Looking here, the Rebbe saying something is a cute word. It's a joke. No, the Rebbe said it. He also actually really meant it really meant it in terms of a perspective on marriage. Um, one of the first emissaries of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, actually just passed away this year, Rabbi Gorelick from Milan, Italy. He was one of the first emissaries. He was sent out in the 50s to Italy, to Milan, Italy. And he, even though he was in Milan, Italy, and especially in those days, overseas travel was very expensive, and he was obviously penniless, but somehow that didn't stop him, and he always, always, always went to the Rebbe, many, 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 many times. One of the times when he went to the Rebbe in the beginning, the Rebbe asked him a very unusual question. The Rebbe said, how is your relationship with your wife? I'd like you to write me about your relationship with your wife. Not that it's too personal to share with the Rebbe, because what is too personal to share with the Rebbe? But it still felt like, like, I can really do it with my wife. That's like what I'm talking about. Anyway, so Rabbi Gorelick wrote and wrote and wrote about his very special, wonderful wife. And he wrote and wrote and wrote, elaborating on his wife's many virtues. And he ended with the words, perhaps I should not have been so profuse in describing her qualities. He wrote this very beautiful thing about his very special wife, I haven't shown his wife. And he wrote this very beautiful thing about all of her amazing, amazing, amazing virtues and qualities and character traits and how what an amazing person she is and the whole dynamics of their marriage. And he ended with that line, perhaps I should not have been so profuse in describing her qualities. And the Rebbe read the whole thing and he crossed out the word not and underlined should. So Rabbi Gorelick ended it, perhaps I should not have been so profuse in describing her qualities. And the Rebbe changed, amended the sentence, perhaps I should have been so profuse in describing her qualities. Now, I think when the Rebbe, again, this, this is what happened. This is no. My thoughts on it is that, well, what's, what's the Rebbe asking this question for? maybe to, to focus him and through him as the story spreads, many, many other men, think about your wife's qualities. Think about the specialness of your relationship and be very profuse in describing her qualities. Be very profuse. Another story actually with the same Rabbi Gorelick, 
This was the first time he came. So again, in those days, this transatlantic flight from Italy to New York, whoa, astronomical, they're penniless, somehow he did it. Then he's there, and of course, he's the whole time he's thinking about being by the Rebbe, being by the Rebbe, being by the Rebbe. So it's like a day or so before he's leaving, and he has an audience with the Rebbe. The Rebbe calls him for an audience. Like, what's the Rebbe calling him in for? What does the Rebbe want to tell him? He's leaving like the next day. The Rebbe said, did you buy your wife a present? It's like, um, so not being so foolish, he said, what does the Rebbe suggest? What does the Rebbe suggest I should buy? He was probably thinking like a bar of chocolate or something. And the Rebbe said, yeah, I think something in gold. So he's like, okay. Um, like, what do I do now? Yeah, he is totally clueless. So the Rebbe said, you know, we'll take care of it. So the Rebbe called his secretary, who had him call a jeweler, jeweler who brought a few gold watches. The Rebbe girl is like now standing in front of these gold watches. He's supposed to pick a watch. He's going to buy it for his wife. And he is like, I don't know. So again, he turns to the Rebbe and he says, um, which one do you think I should pick? And the Rebbe, being the Rebbe, this is a very Rebbe type of thing to do. He looks at the watches and he says, well, the face of that one is the most beautiful and the band of that one is the most beautiful. So he turned to the jeweler. Could you put them together, that face with that band? And the jeweler said he could. And, and he was leaving the next day and it was ready. And Mrs. Gorelick still has it. And when she told the story, when I heard her personally telling the story, she was wearing the watch. Again, it's, it's, it's a very beautiful story. I think it warms every woman's heart. Um, but I, I think the Rebbe did it in like a expressing something of how, of how, what we, what, what, what a good relationship should look like. And if you're going, of course, you're going to come back with a gift. And of course, it's a beautiful gift. Of course, it's meaningful. <laughs> Mrs. Gorelk, I've heard her recently speak. And she said, since then, every single time her husband would travel to the Rebbe, he always knew he had to bring his wife back something. She said he's completely unimaginative. This is completely not his area. And she, he knows she likes a certain brand of perfume. I forget which one she said, maybe like Chanel. And she said she probably has like 100 bottles of it. Because every single time you buy the exact same bottle. So she has like lined up like about a hundred bottles of Chanel. But like, you know, he knew you got to buy your wife something nice because he learned that lesson. Um, actually, there's a story about with the Rebbe and the Rebison, how the Rebbe modeled this. That um, the Rebbe um, asked one of his uh, Hasidim, who was very, 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 had a very special relationship with the Rebbe. And I guess he had something to do with jewelry. I mean, he has a number of businesses. So I guess he also had something to do with jewelry, or I don't know, maybe he was just doing this for the Rebbe without having anything to do with jewelry. I don't, I don't really know that point. But the Rebbe said he wanted to buy the Rebbetson a beautiful pearl necklace. So, and there was not going to go walk into a jewelry store. Could, you know, could this person take care of it? I said, of course. Like, and I don't know if he's in the business or he's not in the business, but obviously he spoke to a jeweler and obviously he said, you know, get the most beautiful pearl necklace. I mean, this is for the Lubavitcher Robinson and don't think of money, the most beautiful pearl necklace for sure. And he comes and he finds this beautiful, beautiful pearl necklace and he gives it to this Hasid, name is Rabbi Garari and Rabbi Garari brings to the Rebbe this beautiful pearl necklace. And the Rebbe looks at it and he says, no, it's not nice enough. It's not nice. Enough. No, I don't want it. Gary was like, uh, you want to get a pearl necklace? This isn't nice enough. I'll find you another one. And he tried again. Three necklaces the Rebbe rejected. <laughs> it was only the fourth necklace that the Rebbe accepted as nice enough for what he wanted to give to the Rebbe. And I think that's like such a beautiful concept of a relationship, of a marriage, of what should go on between a couple that I, I want to get the most beautiful thing. And that's beautiful, but it's not beautiful enough for you. It's not beautiful enough for you. Only the fourth one was, all right, that's beautiful enough. Um, and, and by the Robinson also, I mean, you know, we see both in terms of how every word of the Rebbe she so treasured. There was a chassid that was once giving over to her a brain, a chassidic gathering that had just happened. She wasn't at the gathering, but this 
man came to her after the gathering. So he was telling her and he said, it was, he was just getting over the words. And he said, oh, something really interesting at the gathering. The Rebbe said, everyone should turn their cups upside down. He was just like giving it over. And right away, as soon as she heard it, there was a cup on the table. She turned it upside down. He was like, whoa, like he didn't mean her to turn the cup upside down, but also very beautiful. I thought it was very beautiful. Um, it's a long story. I'm just saying it very briefly because I want to bring out the point. But um, once the Rebbeson hurt her leg, she fell and she hurt her leg. And this was shortly before the holidays, like it was going into like a three-day holiday. It was with Shabbos, this happened on Friday. And it was going into like a three-day holiday, like right afterwards. And therefore the Rebbe had to for brain and do a lot. It's a very, very, very intense, intense time. And she said to the man that was helping in the house, she's like, I don't want the Rebbe to know that I hurt my leg because then he's gonna be worried about me. And now for the next three days, he has to be totally immersed in giving to all the Jews that came to spend the holiday with the Rebbe. I don't want him to be worried about me. So we're not telling him. We're not telling him he's not gonna realize. Now this Hasid is thinking, I'm gonna hide from the Rebbe the fact that the Rebbeson hurt her leg? But I can't tell the rabbits in that, but I can't do that to the Rebbe. So he's like, oh, this is too big for me. I'm just gonna tell the Rebbe and what will be will be. So he he left like before Shabbos to take care of his own things. And he actually ran to 770 and gave a message to the Rebbe <laughs> that the Rebbe doesn't want you to know, but you hurt her leg. <laughs> okay. So they're each, this to me was so beautiful. They're each being so protective of each other. She, the Rebbe is being protective of the Rebbe. She doesn't want him to know she hurt her leg. Like she doesn't want him to have to be bothered. She doesn't want him to be worried, to be concerned. The Rebbe is being so protective of the Rebbe. She hurt her leg, but she doesn't want him to know. Now, how is this going to play out when she literally, she couldn't walk because she hurt her leg. So Friday night, the same man that helped in the house, he was there. She said to him, make Kiddush for me before the Rebbe comes. And I'm going to watch from here because she couldn't walk. She was sitting. She couldn't walk. Her leg was hurt so badly she couldn't walk around. So she, so he made the kid as she walked. So when the Rebbe came home, she was sitting by the table. And she said, oh, I was a little hungry. I already heard kiddish. I already washed. So like, you don't know, know, but I'm not getting up. But it's totally normal because for some strange reason, I decided I wanted to eat. No problem. The Rebbe makes like it's totally normal. The Rebbe makes kiddish, she's sitting. The Rebbe washes, she's sitting. The man serves the first course, she's sitting. Um, I don't remember what happened then, what, what normally happens. Maybe normally she would serve. I don't remember the details, but I remember at one point when it, she would normally get up to do something. Now, again, she couldn't get up, but she didn't want the Rebbe to know that. And the Rebbe didn't want her to know that he knew. So the Rebbe started singing a certain Hasidic melody in a very, very deep way, like almost going into like a trance. Like the Rebbe went into a very deep, deep meditative state, deliberately, but he's just in the very, but he literally was in this very deep state. So when she saw that the Rebbe was in the state, she said, quick, quick, you serve everything now. <laughs> like, you know, when he's in the state, you won't realize. And that's, that's how the meal progressed. Each one protecting the other, each one respecting the other, each one doing what they knew the other would want. And I just thought that was such a beautiful testimony to a marriage that I don't want him to know my foot was very badly hurt. I don't want her to know that I know that her foot was very badly hurt. And each one like protecting the other. So these are just a few ideas, a few stories with the Reverend, with the Reverend Sin, the Reverend General about marriage. Any of them reflect, help you, any of them make you have a, something that you can take from there in terms of your own relationship it could be in terms of marriage or it could be in terms of relationships in general because obviously many of these ideas apply to many significant relationships in our life well i just want to say that uh 10 years ago today we decided to go to the oil to get engaged. And, ten years uh, ago today, wow! Ten years exactly. <laughs> and then so. Yudalef, Yudalef Nisan, we actually got married. So like two weeks later, wow! Yeah, yeah. So I stood, um, I stood in front of the Rebbe's uh, um, 
you know, Tzion, <clears throat> and I and I read a lot of Tehillim, and I asked her for a bracha that uh, that it will be matzliach and that I'll be able to give, you know, as much and be, I mean, not as much, but, you know, to, to, to take from her how to be a wife. Wow. So that that's was a, that's very, a, that's very That's a pretty special. high yardstick. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. And we got an amazing bracha also. So wow. it was beautiful. Wow. Yeah. 10 years ago. Mazal tov. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Beautiful day to get engaged. Beautiful day to get married. You started off right. Yeah. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. I think that's what gave us the koach. <laughs> and that's lacha. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Anyone else? Something from the ideas I shared? Someone has something that they that they could reflect on and see how it could apply to them, to their life, to their marriage, or to their relationships with people in general. Of course, ultimately to relationship with God. I mean, I think we should all just be so lucky to have a, such a respectful relationship between people, anyone, you know, that's I think something that we should all strive for. Right. Strive for it. Because from a started by saying we should be so lucky. And I was going to say <laughs> there's a lot of work involved in creating those relationships. So but then she wrote, then she said we should strive for it. So I think I think there's the we should strive. It's sort of like a model of like what uh, for me used a nice word, what a really respectful and loving relationship looks like. And that when you know that's what it looks like striving, like how do I up my game in 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 expressing that respect and expressing that love obviously we all want to receive that but how do i work on giving it how do i work on creating the atmosphere that that's natural that that's the assumption very very true anyone else okay so another idea, I said I had three things I was thinking of in terms of the rabbits and tonight. So one was marriage that I thought was obviously relevant for all of us. And I know for myself, I, I, I was inspired when I was just thinking of all these different ideas in terms of like, like from a said, wow, this is what marriage is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be that respectful, loving, nurturing, and however good it is, we always can make it better. And that's, that's really beautiful. Something else, of course, I was thinking was what the Rebbe shared, and this I do believe I, I said actually at much greater length in terms of the Rebbe since passing a few months ago, so I'm not going to go into all the details, which I shared then, just to remind you of the main ideas, the main central point that the Rebbe shared on the fifth anniversary of the passing of the Rebbe, that her passing was a demarcation line in bringing Mashiach that women are the catalyst for Mashiach. And she, Rebbe Sanchai Mashka, as the daughter of the previous Rebbe, she is the feminine embodiment of Rebbe. And women bring Mashiach. So she's the feminine embodiment of Rebbe. Women bring Mashiach. So her passing, and of course, by a very holy person, as we've touched on over the years, we've discussed this idea that the passing is like the climax, the culmination, of their life service. So this is like representing, this is like the representative woman's who's supposed to bring Mashiach climax, transferring the world into the days of Mashiach. Now, I'm not going to go into really more details on this idea because I do believe that a few months ago on the anniversary of her passing, I really explained this idea at length. So I'm just sort of reminding us, but I felt even though we touched on it then and I didn't want to repeat things I said before, but I felt just in terms of our own service, this is such a central theme to the Rebetzin as the woman bringing Mashiach and to us as the women bringing Mashiach. We are all super powerful women. We are very old. We are all very old souls. We have been here many, many, many times. I don't remember, but we have been here many times. And good is eternal which means in every single lifetime, all the good that you accrued, all the godly that you did, that lasts forever. 
that's still part of your arsenal. If you were imperfect and did some things wrong, that you repent for, that's transient, but good stays forever. Forever meaning crossing the lines literally into the next lifetime. So at this moment, when all of us have been here, we all were here by the Tower of Babylonia. We all were here in Egypt. We all were here by the generation of Rabshim Bar Yochai. And we all have been here many, many times for our own personal growth and development and trajectory. And every single drop of good we ever did in any of those lifetimes is all part of us now. So when I say we're old souls, I mean we're very, very strong souls because we're laden with all that we've accomplished over all the lifetimes. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing the power each one of us have. I mean, it's, it can be pretty tough sometimes. And we're really up to it. We're really that powerful. So I thought it'd be nice in connection with the Robertson's birthday, a, a woman energy and women as a catalyst to Mashiach for us to like think or share Bottom line, what do we do to bring Mashiach? We always talk about this. Some of you have been in this class for, I always think of Mosheh's date, right? So she's almost 12. So like 10 and a half years. So you've heard this many, 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 many times. Women, women bringing the redemption. Rebbe Zanchai Mushka bringing the world to redemption. So if you ask yourself, what, what do I do? What can I look at in my life that I could say now that helps bring the redemption? Or what can I dedicate from my life? Well, I would think that um, learning from the Rebetzin, she completely gave her life to others. I mean, you know, her husband was out with the Hasidim um, all the time, you know, so maybe... Uh, to learn from her of giving to others from our own time um, would help bring Mashiach. I mean, for those who need. That's a beautiful idea. I, a few months ago when we spoke about the Rebetzin, I think I told several stories along the lines of what Rachel is mentioning now, how the Rebetzin selflessness. I don't know if anyone remembers. Yeah, a few months ago, but how selfless she was and how she was so other-centered. And it's obviously, as Rachel's saying, her selflessness in giving up a lot of her time with the Rebbe, a lot of her personal husband to become the leader of world Jewry. That's like a very big personal sacrifice. Um, but also, and also in terms of her interactions with people, how she always was like, other centered and put the other person first. And these other people could be very small people, but like she treated each one as if each one was a very big person because she viewed every person as a very big person, as deserving of her respect and focus and attention and compassion. So that's a beautiful co combination what Rachel is saying in terms of thinking about the quality of the Rebetzin and a quality that could bring Mashiach is really being more other centered and really thinking of other people and trying to really help other people as there are of course many 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 people in this world that could use our help that's a beautiful idea anyone else anything that you can think of that you do or that you'd like to do or that you want to do that you could dedicate and say you know this action this i'll be doing to bring mashiach this i do anyway but i'd like to make it a something I do to bring Mashiach action. Well, something I want to say, I was thinking about today about the Rebetzin that I admire is something like I would love to strive to be like her is how sneeze she was. Like not even, not even talking about her clothing, just her personality. She was very, very sneeze in a way that 
I think most people should strive to be, you know, and like, we don't realize sometimes even like actions or things we say are, could be not sneeze. And we don't even, you know, I think realize it, but I think to her, it was so natural. And well, from a, that's what was, the, that was my third topic about the Robinson. So you're right. What from a saying <laughs> is something about the Robinson she was thinking today was the Robinson's innate modesty and refinement. And she says she doesn't only mean in dress, she means in her whole character and her whole demeanor and her whole relationship with people. And yes, I, 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 even though I think we might have discussed it a few months ago, I thought I couldn't exactly remember if we did or if we didn't, but I was no, I could talk about the Robinson and not bring that in. So, cause it was so, so her. So I agree with you for a moment. That's definitely, if you're thinking of an overarching, just such an obvious lesson from the Robinson, Rachel said a very obvious one in terms of really focusing to build the other person. And you're saying a really huge point of the Robinson and point of woman is her innate modesty, regal, refined demeanor, and how that is definitely something a person can take on as like, I'd like to be more refined. I'd like to be more modest. I'd like to create that like refined beauty around me. I remember one year in honor of the Robinson, I took on using China on Shabbos, like no more paper plates, China. <laughs> I still basically do it. And I, it, was, it was, sounds like a funny thing to say as a religious uh, concept, but I meant it in a very religious way. Because to me, that's like, I think of the rabbits and all paper plates, only beautiful China. That's like a royalty, regal, refined. So yes, definitely. That is, that is definitely something that we probably all could strive to improve in the however good we're in, we are in that area. And that's definitely something we can say, listen, this, this should bring Mashiach. This the God I'm doing for you, I'm doing to bring Mashiach. Anyone else? Any other ideas of things they do or things they would like to do or things they could do or should do that they could dedicate to? I'm this Jewish woman supposed to be bringing Mashiach. What can I do to bring Mashiach? Rivka? Oh, how did you know I was thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Just yearning for Mashiach. And uh, I, I, when Sarah thinks, um, when I have challenging things, and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to solve it. I start yearning for Mashiach. And I'm thinking, and, and I dream about it and really, really yearning for this. That, that's what I that is. That is a very, we are told that that's, it's actually interesting you say that because our sages say that when a person passes away, there'll be three questions they will be asked. Every single one of us will be asked three questions like, by, so to speak, the gates of heaven. I mean, that's, very sounds very Christian way to express concept. But as we ascend, as our souls ascend, there will be three questions will be asked. And one of them will be, did you yearn for the redemption? Did you anticipate the redemption? Were you hoping and longing and envisioning the redemption? That is one of the three. Um, I know the, the other one is, um, were you honest? And the, th the third one might be, did you fix times for Torah study? I think I'm not positive, but I know. Did you yearn for the redemption? And were you honest? And the third one might be, I think it is, but I'm not 100% sure. Did you fix time for Torah study? So it's very interesting. We're told these are the, th obviously our whole life is going to pass in front of our eyes and everything we did is, you know, going to be instant replay. And obviously what we did, all the good we did, we can't understand the good, how good the good is. We don't get it. I am sure every single one of us has done so many good things that they don't, oh, they're not aware of. Oh, that was a little thing. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, we don't even see how good is our good. And conversely, we don't get how bad is our bad. 
We don't realize how amazingly valuable every little effort and good we make. And we don't realize how detrimental is the other side. But, and that's going to be, that's true of everything in our life. And everything in our life is going to be reviewed. And we're going to literally see everything in our life. But the three questions, the three overarching questions are, again, number one, did you yearn? Did you anticipate? Were you focused on the redemption? So I think what, what Rivka is saying is a beautiful, a beautiful perspective on how can I bring Mashiach by yearning for it? And maybe by remembering to yearn for it, not only when life seems unsolvable, but also the other times. And the other times also to remember to yearn for redemption. That's why, of course, by a Jewish wedding, and this most joyous moment, right? The most joyous moment, the chuppah, before Mazel Tov, you smash a glass. And we, we think like smashing the glass must be some like good omen or something. We smash the glass to remember the destruction of the temple. At that moment of most incredible joy, we also want to remember we need Mashiach. So it's in all times, in the hard times and even, even in the good times. We need Mashiach. We need to yearn for Mashiach. We need to want Mashiach. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thought on how you can bring Mashiach. Anyone else has an idea of what they could do or what they would like to do or what they are doing? Cyril, can I ask you a quick question? You just mentioned the three questions. Um, and one of them, did you have a fixed time of studying Torah? But what about if uh, women don't have a... Uh, a requirement <clears throat> is there kind of exempt from fixed time of prayers or things like this wouldn't that exempt women of fixed time women are oh, so i said first of all i i do want to give a disclaimer i think that's the third question i should i should really look and i will put on on our group because i i don't want to i'm saying very honestly that's in my brain i could be completely wrong um but just answering if this question if that is or isn't the question uh, that one is asked after death, definitely the other two I'm very confident on. See, peace of Yeshua. Did you anticipate? Did you yearn? Did you long for redemption? And were you honest in your dealings? Were you honest in all of your business pursuits? Those definitely are two. And I think, and I could be wrong, that the third is, did you learn properly? And I will look that up and, and tell you later. Um, so the Baba Tereva says, if only a man would learn only what a woman needs to know. Meaning a woman does not have the obligation to constantly learn, which a man does have. But a woman as a Jew has an obligation to know Tyra, to know which parts, to know all parts relevant to her. So all of Jewish law that's relevant, which is most of Jewish law, she has to know. All of Hasidic thought, anything that has to do with loving God and fearing God, she has to know the same way a man because that's to inspire us to serve properly. So if we just only know what a woman needs to know, a man will be in pretty good shape. So I would say a woman is not responsible to have fixed times of study, but she's responsible to know which requires study. So we're responsible to study enough to know what we need to know to serve God properly in an inspired, true, deep fashion. And that's what God's holding us responsible for. But in terms of prayer, we are responsible to pray twice a day, morning and afternoon prayers. The woman is not responsible for the evening prayers, but is responsible for morning and afternoon prayers. Even though you're right, there are many commandments that are time-oriented that a woman is exempt from, but prayer is not one of them. Anyone else have something they could think of as like, like what they would like to focus on in terms of them as this old soul back here one more time to bring the redemption? What could they do to bring the redemption? Well, maybe we're going to stop on this thing because I did have that third one. So we said the first thing we focused on was relationships and how we could be so inspired by the Rebbe and Rebbe's relationship and how we could apply that to our own relationships. 
The second thing was the Robertson as this woman that brought redemption and how we can apply that. And we got three beautiful answers to really be those women that are the catalyst of redemption. And the third thing I wanted to talk about, I told you there were three, which from already <laughs> jumped to, because it's so obvious when you're talking about the Robertson, is the idea of modesty and refinement. This is the, a major aspect of being a Jewish woman. This is a way we as women serve God is through our modesty, modesty and refinement. Now, anyone who knew the Robinson personally, which I was definitely not one of those people, but anyone who had a personal relationship with the Robinson always, always mentions this point because it was so strongly her. And there were so many different aspects to it. So as from a set, it's not only in dress, it's in so many, many things. Modesty is like how you treat others, how you hold yourself, refinement, how she kept in her house. She didn't want to receive anything for being the Rebbitson. She never wanted this privileges or honors or perks or favors. And if she was ever recognized and was given extra privileges, like come to the front of the line, this is the Rebbitson. She wanted to go back to that store. She, she didn't want that. Don't, 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 don't focus on me and give me extra. I'm not looking for that. I want to stand humbly in the line. Uh, she, she never wanted extra attention, extra favors, her sensitivity to other people's needs. I think that's a very strong expression of modesty and refinement is being sensitive to other people. And it, like someone said about his own family that, if any child ever got engaged, so they're bringing the new potential new son-in-law or daughter-in-law to visit the rabbits in. And the rabbits in would always say, wait a few days. Why? Because she wanted to do research. Again, she had a very small circle of people she spoke to. So among her small circle, she wanted to do research. Who is this man or woman that I've never met before? I want to do some research on his family or her family to know some nice things to say to make the person feel comfortable. And it's like such a like backwards perspective. Like everyone else is like, oh, I'm such an important person and I'm being so gracious because I'm making time for you. And the Robinson's thinking, how can I make you feel comfortable? How can I make you feel relaxed? How can I say, oh, I know your grandmother. I know your great uncle. I know your third cousin. And they're such nice people and this and this and this detail. So you feel good. So you feel relaxed. So you're at ease. And in general, people always said that about the rabbits. And so many different people with so many different types of relationships with her. This was like a common theme. You always hear that she always steered the conversation very graciously around the other person, around their interests. So they were comfortable. So they felt understood. This could be a person that met her once and never again. This could be a person that was a frequent visitor in her house. It didn't make a difference. She treated everyone the same. She treated everyone with that refinement, that modesty of like focusing the spotlight on them. You know, obviously modesty expressed itself in its dress. As we've discussed, modesty expresses itself in hair covering. Modesty expresses itself in a refined choice of words. Modesty expresses itself in a refined choice of thought of what you're gonna allow yourself to think about, but you're not gonna allow yourself to think about. Modesty is adhering to all the laws separating men and women. I do believe I shared this story, how when the Robinson was in France, this was during the Holocaust, and a man came to her door to do something that was illegal, you know, whatever, giving her this sum of money, or she was giving him a sum of money. And he was so surprised because when he comes in, the Robinson closes the door, which makes sense. They're doing something that you don't want anyone else to know. This is wartime, World War II, Holocaust time. And then she, I think it was like French door windows and she opened them and he's like, what are you doing? Like you're closing the door, but you're opening wide these windows. We don't want anyone to know about this. And she said, yeah, a man and a woman aren't allowed to be together with everything closed. So even to that degree, during a war, during a Holocaust, doing something that she wouldn't want anyone to know about, but you've got to put the laws of modesty first. So I thought there was so many ways, which could be in dress, could be in thought, could be in speech, could be in relationships with men, could be in relationships with men and women. There's so many things that express this 
Jewish modesty, Jewish refinement. We've all lost it a little, me for sure. You know, we're a product of a world that trashes these values, that violates these values, that mocks these values. But this is an innate Jewish behavior to have such refinement, to have such scrupulous adherence to God's vision of modesty that during a war and during a Holocaust, you're opening wide the windows that everyone could see in because a man and a woman are alone, can't do that. Modesty and refinement are a very critical issue. And as such, very, very difficult. Very difficult for every single woman in the world. And man too, but we're talking about women. Very difficult. And Firma said before, she was thinking of that in terms of bringing the redemption, and she's absolutely right. The fact that it's so difficult is because it's so critical. You know, when, when Adam and Chava, when Adam and Eve were first created on that first Friday of creation, the day that we celebrate as Rosh Hashanah, and they were given one commandment, not to eat from a certain tree. And they only had to abstain for three hours from eating from that tree. And they weren't hungry. They were in a garden full of beautiful fruit trees. They could have eaten as much fruit as they want from all the other trees of the garden. And yet they sinned. And of course, there's many, many, many ways, many deep levels of explaining how they possibly sinned. But on a very basic level, Bob Tereba says, and I know I've shared this before, but it's a very strong thought to remember. He said, that was their mitzvah. That was their mission. And since that was the reason they were existing, the forces of evil put all the pressures for exactly them to mess up in that area. Exactly in that area, you want to pray, you want to study, be as holy as you want, but eat from that tree because that's what you have to do. So that's where your challenge is going to be. So I would think literally globally, literally across the world. I can't say every because there's exceptions to, to anything, but I would give it a healthy 99 plus percent of all women in the world struggle with some level of modesty, with some aspect of refinement because it's that important, because it's that critical. And that's why we all are challenged in that area. So as, as Jewish woman, where do you find yourself challenged with your modesty? What area of modesty do you think is a challenge for you? And I said, there's many different areas. There's how you dress, there's how you talk, there's how you walk, there's how you interact with people, there's how you interact with women, there's how you interact with men, there's how you interact with both covering your hair and you know like there's so many areas of modesty what you allow yourself to think about what you allow yourself to watch what you allow yourself to read media internet tv movies i mean there's so much like it's a limitless list of areas that we could struggle with in terms of modesty so any any ideas of people of what areas they struggle with in terms of modesty All of them. Oh, all of them, all of them. <laughs> Every single thing you listed. <laughs> of course. I mean, at least for me, all of them. We could relate, right? That, 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 that makes sense, that answer. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I would agree. <laughs> you agree. <laughs> Well, you know, so I came from the secular world, you know, and became Bala Teshuva. And in the secular world, you talk with everybody, men, women. You don't think about, you know, how you are. You know, I, I guess for me, maybe more that... To, to be more distant when I talk to, to men in general. You know, but like, you know, when, when they come and sit around my table, you know, the, the conversation goes and I don't really know where, where I'm supposed to be 
careful, you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. What's the line? The line of being polite, the line of being a nice hostess, the line of being more friendly than you should be. Exactly. And so, uh, I think that's the area. Right. And also, when you in an uh, environment where people learn the same Torah and the same rules, it's a little bit easier, right? Because people around you also At least know, they know the rules. They know the rules, right. But when you go out in the world, um, people don't know the rules. And uh, it's challenging. And, um, and also, um, like, for Balchua, we grew up with certain things that we enjoy, that uh, we find pleasure, maybe in certain music or certain uh, entertainment, right? And um, it's, uh, it's challenging. You know, what you said, Chav, about when you go out into the world, it's reminded me because we dedicated this class to Hannah's son, to Moshe. He should have a complete, complete healing. So I'm remembering something Hannah said once about her husband that inspired me very much. So I'm saying this in, you know, to bring, to give them more merit. Um, Achav is saying about, it's even difficult when people are in the world of people that know the roles, how much more so when you're in the world of people that don't know the roles. So I remember at some years ago, I don't remember when, at some class, definitely way, way pre-COVID, um, Hannah said how her husband came to a decision not to seek a, a better job, not to seek a higher employment, because he said every time he would go for a job interview, you know, it's a woman of HR shaking, you know, sticking out her hand, and he's just like so, like, I, 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 I can't touch her hand, and I'm not going to touch her hand, that looks so awkward, and then he said, forget it. I'm keeping my job. <laughs> I'm not looking for another employment. This is it. This is where I'm meant to be. And I was like, just so like impressed that somebody would literally, you know, that's, you know, gets down to the, the dollars and cents of our life and would say, no, I, I'm, I'm putting modesty first. And I'm in a world where they don't know those roles. So again, other people, I'm not saying that's the only way to handle it. And I'm sure everyone that interacts with the secular world as everybody here basically does, you know, you sort of figure out what's your line, how do you do it? How do you graciously handle it or not so graciously handle it? I, I know even some woman said to me, she's not in the class here, but she said another one of my classes, she said when she knows she was meeting someone new, she would send them an email before saying that. Like, you know, like just a heads up, you know, I'm sure she phrased it nicely, but as a religious woman, I don't shake hands. Like, I don't want, you know, you know, like, I don't want them to feel awkward and like rejected, <laughs> but um, so it's, 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 but it's, the have is right. It, it makes it that much more challenging when people around you don't know the rules, but you do. I heard, I heard uh, one time that the Rebbe said to a woman when he, when he, she wanted to shake his hand. So he said, I do not touch anything that doesn't belong to me. Yes. And that's the line that I usually use. Yes, when yes that's, that's, that's I'm a nice like line. I'm meeting or something, yes. I usually tell them so. They understand usually. Yes, 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 yes. That 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 is that was that was once uh, the Rebbe said that to a woman. Yes, and then like everybody has different things they can graciously carry off, and some people say I'd never be able to say that. <laughs> I just sort of like stand there with my hand on my side and act like I'm spaced out, you know. But it's, uh, yeah, the hub is right. Anyone else challenges they see in their, in, their, um, in their life specifically, how they, the specific arena of modesty that challenges them? I wanted to add just that I think the world is, I mean, obviously not everywhere you go, but there are places where, you know, someone, this has happened to me where a man put out his hand to me and I was like, I was weirded out. Like, I was like, what? And then he was like, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I know some people don't. You're, are you okay with that? You're not comfortable? It's probably a religious thing, right? And I was like, 
yeah like like it was such a weird thing when it happened and I think the world is like we're coming closer to Mashiach so I think the world is starting maybe a little bit you know like you'll randomly see it like not everywhere you go maybe that was a perk of COVID (laughs) people are taking each other's hands as frequently maybe there was a little bark there but that's nice that's nice let's look let's turn the question around let's be positive what area would you say your modesty shines we're all jewish women we're all challenged with modesty and we all have innate modesty inside us that was not tarnished by all of the vicissitudes of life so where where does your modesty shine Rachel I don't know how much it shines but I just want to say that I enjoy it so much that was something unexpected for me since we started being observant I started learning the laws of modesty and it just gives me such pleasure. I'm sure that I make mistakes and not everything is perfect, but it's such a pleasure to be dressed modestly and to speak modestly and cover the hair. I just enjoy it. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. That's every Jewish woman should. And that's so beautiful that God gave you that gift of sensitivity that you're like, yes, all my life, I was dressing in a way that didn't make me feel good. And now I found the way that I feel good. And I was talking in a way that didn't make me feel good. And now I found the way that makes me feel so much better. That's so beautiful. Because that's truly should be our experience with every aspect of Judaism we embrace. Every one of us should be like, oh, Shabbos. I'm so glad for Shabbos. I am so glad for Shabbos. That is my perspective on Shabbos. Oh, kosher. I feel so good that with the food I'm putting in my in my body is what God is saying is the right food for my body. Oh, modesty. I feel so good dressing this way. This feels the right way to dress. It's very interesting. Like I know um, um, Tom was showing me once how uh, laws of a certain company, how the women are supposed to dress and it was like, wow, they're really saying like we call laws of modesty. Like this is this is this is how the human brain is wired to understand this is the appropriate way to dress. It's just the world doesn't want to do that. <laughs> it doesn't want to be, it doesn't want to worship appropriate and refined and godly and moral. But it feels good to do it and feel good about it. That's so beautiful, Rachel. That's definitely a great answer. That's beautiful. Anyone else? You don't have to give that answer. That's a very, very special answer. But anyone else can think of even one area where they feel their modesty shines, what they feel good about, like Rachel was saying, in terms of modesty. Can I, I want to add something beautiful that I saw. So I work in a daycare in the mornings and there was this lady who had a baby. So she was on maternity leave and her husband was dropping his daughter off every day. And she would always want to come straight to me, like from her father's arms, like she would reach out for me while he was still holding her. And one thing that I was so impressed with how sneez he was, he always, he never handed anything to me. He always put his daughter down. He put the coat down. He put, he put everything down on the table, the chair, the floor, you know, and I think that that was just a very beautiful thing that. I want to do, you know, um, I think I have even tried to, since then, you know, I don't deal with men very often, um, cause I'm in an all girls school, but when I do, I, I try to pay attention to that. Cause I think that that was like a very beautiful thing that it's not obligated in the Torah to do that, but it's just the nice added extra beautiful sneeze thing. You're absolutely right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a refinement. That's refinement. When it's, when it's you, when it's natural, it doesn't only have to be, wait, let me open my book of Jewish law. This is how a refined person will behave. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. So that's a beautiful example. Anyone else for, for, for some aspect that they feel, some aspect of modesty that they feel they 
they're 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 shining in they feel good in okay I will, i'll try some um to use a proper language um because um i hear people a lot of people around me again i'm talking about people who are outside of observant world not careful with the language and um and i i uh, that's one thing that like very strong for me and even when i talk to other people and uh, they allow themselves what that um how to say just i can't hear it's so not just i i'm not using them but it's hard to hear for me and i'm always like ask them not to use those words they're not appropriate and they just like just stop <laughs> whatever so that how, how do people I, respond when you say that how does it depend on the person or do you have a general response when you say that um most of them try to comply nice that's very nice you have to be strong to say that instead of just like cringing inside but that's that's nice that when you actually say that the person respects that and or at least tries to respect it and understands that right there's one doesn't need to just litter their speech with trash um so that's that's an area that you that you that resonates with you that yes that that the refinement in speech that was a that was something you appreciate yes thank you someone else some other part of modesty that they really feel yeah that that i appreciate that part i shine with that part i resonate with that part i'm glad i know about that and strive to do it um more refined taste in what entertainment i i like now you know it's been um, it's been years since I've been watching TV. It just, it's not the same for me anymore. You know, I, I just, and I just noticed that things that I maybe liked years ago, I have, I, I have no interest in it anymore. It, it, I, I have, um, uh, food for the soul is completely different for me now. Um, it's Torah and, and I just don't need, that entertainment that I used to like before. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'm sure it was a gradual process, but that's that's beautiful to be able to, and a lot of times those shifts, it's a little subtle shift and a little subtle shift and a little subtle shift. And then you look back and you're like, what? How did that happen? I wasn't planning on changing. I didn't have to change, so to speak. I don't know if that's one of the laws, but just as you refine yourself and refine yourself and refine yourself, the natural consequence is that I want to put my head in that garbage, immorality, steeped in all the, you know, every entertainment is like just trying to get to the most base nature of man and then a little bit lower than that sometimes. <laughs> and that's and that's and that's what people will watch. That's what will sell. That's what will get an audience. So, and then it's just sort of just this gradual, like, that's not me. It's sort of that like princess vision. There's, there's, it says that every Jewish woman is, is a princess, is a queen, but we just use a, a princess. And you envision that a true princess as, as Torah is defining a princess as again, this very, very refined person and a very, just sort of beautiful. That's why I'm saying like for me, saying seriously one year in a very serious way, my resolution, I think was on the yard side of the rabbit sim was to use China and polish my silver. <laughs> because I really felt that's how she lived. That's regal, that's beautiful, that's gracious, that's yeah. dignified. That's part of this whole persona 
which was saying, right, when you're in that space and then you see this crass appealing to your most base nature animal element and like that, no, that's, I, I, I don't want that. I, that used to entertain me. It's so weird. I used to like that. I used to enjoy it. That is the natural development. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. So Rifka, you did it right. Because that's what's supposed to happen. And if it didn't happen yet, that's okay, guys. Give yourself a little more time. But that is literally what's supposed to happen. That you'd be like, what? I don't, I don't enjoy that. I don't want that. I'm not looking for that. It's not a temptation I'm not going to do. I wouldn't want that. That's not appealing. Because when you're in a very refined space, that seems so distasteful. And again, everyone's different. And someone could say, no, I've been doing this for years and I still find it very attractive and I still enjoy it. And I don't find it tasteful at all. And that's fine. We are all wired differently. But it's very beautiful when a person just like, you know, can go on that journey or just like, like Chava said, she appreciates the refined language. Rachel's saying she appreciates all these aspects. Rivka's saying she, she doesn't want that anymore. That's, that's a tremendous testimony to what it means to be living a modest life, that it really changes you on the inside. The change is really that, it, that what you really are can now freely shine, because that is what every one of us truly is on the inside. Anyone else? Anyone else have, have, have something that they really relate to in modesty, that they enjoy, that resonates with them? For me, it's covering my hair at all times. Uh, even during my sleep, if I wake up and my hair is not covered, I'll, I'll reach for my tichel to make sure it's covered. And the other thing that was very, very challenging is wearing socks in the summer. <laughs> that was very, very difficult. And um, I made the commitment many, many years ago. And I stick to it. I always cover my feet, you know, when I, so that's the two things. So they were difficult. And do they, do you feel now that these are areas that you have ownership of? Or that you're still I do have, challenged? I do, I, I do have ownership, but in the summer, it's still, it's not easy. It's hot, <laughs> you know, it but it doesn't matter. I do not leave the house. I do not even go downstairs without uh, putting my socks on. That's really beautiful. And you know what? When something is difficult, we know it's a sign that's very valuable and very precious to God when we're doing the difficult. And we all, in general, are going to have parts of serving God that are going to be challenging. And we all, I'm sure, maybe not Rachel, but my rest of us will all have some part of modesty that will be difficult. Some maybe more subtle area or more overt area that will be difficult. And then and God says, I'm so happy that you're putting me first. I so appreciate it that you are putting me first. And, and I think just thinking of this vision of the Rebbitson and this to me is such a, she's representing like womanhood. And she is yeah. such, it's like, it's like, it's like such a, it's like so modest. It's like so intently modest that it's like, wow, that's, that's, that's just like a Jewish woman. And that's, you know, each one of us, however, we do or don't fall short of that model, but at least we're looking at it and saying like, how do I walk a step closer to that? How do I walk a step closer? So Rachel saying like for her, it's covering the hair and covering her feet. That's how she's walking that step closer. How do I, again, am I going to be there? That's the shining ultimate example. How do I, how do I get a little closer to be part of that light, be part of that aura? Anyone else? Anyone else have something they, they would share in terms of that part of modesty that they do relate to, that does help them, that they feel good about?
Well, think about it because truly, I am sure every single one of us has that part that challenges us and has that part that actually feels good. And you think inside yourself, what part? Maybe it's very easy to think of your challenges, but what, what part actually do I appreciate feels good? Do I feel I'm closer to God? Do I feel I'm more like God would want me to be? I'm speaking more like he would want, or I'm thinking more like he would want, or I'm watching more like he would want, or I'm dressing more like he would want, or I'm covering parts of myself more like I know God would want. And it feels good when you feel you're, you're walking with God and you're doing it as God would want. So some thoughts, some inspiration from Rebbe Tzanchai Mushka on her birthday today. Her birthday is a day of great power. So we wanted to tap in a bit. Let's just briefly do some laws of Shabbos. I know it's late. We were talking last week about squeezing on Shabbos and how connecting to um, fruits and what you can eat and can eat and the grapefruit and the grapes and the olives and all these things. So an interesting question. Some people, if they have a stain, they're going to clean it old fashioned way with lemon juice. So are you allowed to do that on Shabbos? If you have a stain, can you use lemon juice to clean it? So if you already have like real lemon in your fridge, you know, you have a bottle of lemon juice, you squeezed it before Shabbos, or you just ha have a commercial bottle like the rest of us in the fridge, no problem. You're allowed to use that lemon juice. It's not squeezed on Shabbos. But you are not allowed to rub the lemon or rub a lemon peel to remove the stain, even though you truly are only doing it. You're not trying to like, you're not going to drink it afterwards. You're not trying to squeeze out lemon juice for your drinking pleasure. But inevitably, if you're going to rub the fruit or rub the peel on your skin, some juice is probably going to come out. And therefore, that is forbidden, even though you are sincerely only doing it to remove the stain and you are not have no interest in the juice. But if there's bottled lemon juice, you want to pour the lemon juice on, you know, go ahead. Um, ice cubes. So that's a different concept within squeezing. We're like squeezing, it's not a fruit, it's not a vegetable even. Yes, but it, it produces a juice, it produces a liquid. So can you use ice cubes on Shabbos? Well, you can, but with care. Meaning, ideally, you should not fill your cup with ice and then pour the liquid. You should first pour the drink and then add the ice cubes. Why? So then when the cubes melt, they're naturally melting into the juice or the drink, whatever's in your cup, the wine, the soda, whatever it is, the juice. So it's not like creating a new liquid, uh, interesting form of squeezing or juicing. For the same reason, you can't crush the ice cubes on Shabbos. Because if you smash them and crush them, you're just like not paying attention. You're playing with your fork, playing with your spoon. Or maybe you do want to crush it. You like crushed ice. I mean, if, you, if it's in your mouth and you're chewing it, it's not a problem. But like I'm saying, in your cup or in the bowl, crushing it is going to produce a, a juice, a liquid, the water from the ice. So that is forbidden on Shabbos. And it'd be the same thing if there was snow. You can't like start smashing that snow outside. It doesn't make a difference because you would be, so to speak, squeezing. You'd be producing a liquid. For the same reason, baby wipes. It's a problem using baby wipes on Shabbos if you want to change a baby's diaper or some people use baby wipes just to clean their hands or clean things because baby wipes are saturated with a, a liquid that just naturally as you use it, you're not trying to squeeze, you're not squeezing out the wipe, but obviously there's a certain pressure when you're using it and then the liquid's gonna very obviously come out. So therefore you're not allowed to use them on Shabbos. Now I do know there is some religious company that made a kosher for Shabbos baby wipes. They're kosher for Shabbos because they're completely dry and therefore pointless. So there's no point in using, my personal experience is do not waste anybody's time or money using kosher for Shabbos baby wipes because they're so kosher for Shabbos, they're pointless. But if you would use regular baby wipes as you could check any day of the week besides Shabbos, yes, very obviously some liquid comes out. I mean, you're not thinking of the liquid coming out, but there's that moisture that came from that baby wipe, which means you squeezed which means you're not allowed to use it on Shabbos. Um, the same thing, you couldn't use a, a alcohol, if there was like a cotton ball that had alcohol in it, you know, prepared cotton ball, you, could, you can't pour the alcohol on the cotton ball. 
and use it because then that's going to squeeze it. And you can't use if it was a prepared like cotton with alcohol on it, you like you used to like clean a wound or something. You can't use it on Shabbos for the same reason. It's moist enough that some of the liquid's going to squeeze out and that's forbidden on Shabbos. So you see there are ramifications to squeezing besides um, uh, grapes and olives and, and lemon juice. It really applies with anything. It could apply with ice. It could apply with baby wipes. It could apply with alcohol pads. All of them all would be the same concept of squeezing. Any questions on these laws or any other laws of Shabbos? I have never heard that about baby wipes. I have been using baby wipes. Absolutely. I never knew that. How are you supposed to, like babies, like on their So like what you, what you would touch. do is you would just wash them. Just take the baby and wash them like underwater to clean them and then dry them with a towel. Wow, I did not know that. That's so interesting. Okay. I can't believe I did not know that. <laughs> like we used to do in our country. Okay, that's how you did it. You wash them with water and you dry them with a the towel. Yeah, always, always. It always worked. Yeah. I remember, when I remember when my oldest, who's now 32, was born. And I was like, well, how am I supposed to change a diaper on Shabbos? And then I'm like, okay, that's how. And yeah, it worked. And I raised many children and it worked. It's how they did it in the old town. Now they did it in Russia. It works in America too. You can wash them and dry them in the towel. It works perfectly. Now. They probably will come out a little too much. It all works perfectly. Um, Healthier, actually, will be than those. Absolutely. More healthy. Absolutely. Very natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no chemicals. Just, just exactly. Chemicals. It works very well. Exactly. Any other questions? Is this everything not natural? I'm so against. We, we live in a world that's very not healthy for that reason. I know. Yeah. True. And I guess every one of us has to say, well, how much am I going to protect myself in the world? How much am I just going to say, oh, whatever, you know, <laughs> this is how we live. But when you read in the Talmud, even Maimonides, who was many, many years after the Talmud, many generations after, uh -huh. Talmud gives guidance for health, health laws. And we're told that we can't really follow them necessarily. Some we can, some we can't, because our bodies aren't strong enough, because we live in such a polluted environment. So in general, our bodies are weaker. And the same thing with Maimonides. Maimonides, in his magnum opus, in which he's writing for us all the laws of Torah, he gives us many, many health laws. And he guarantees, he said, if you follow yeah. these laws, you will yeah. always be healthy. Yeah. And some people try to follow them. And some people say, our bodies, you know, we live in such a different world. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, it's so different. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we don't have that same natural health to be able to be on the level to follow his laws. Yeah. But you're right. Each one, each one of us compromises and each one of us tries. Yeah. It's Thank true. you so much for joining. Thank you. Take inspiration from the Rebbe We should all strive another step closer to that model. We should all have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much. For Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.